TLO, what's poppin'? We are not live, but we are on Twitch. So you can leave a like, comment, subscribe, turn on your post notification bells. Let's continue to grow the family from Chicago to the UK. If you happen to, if we do happen to go live and you miss a live event, this is this is the channel above me where you can go check it out. Any clips from it, um, link in the description. Don't forget if you want to support the channel or you know show some love in any type of way. Hey, just go be a Patreon member. That's how you do it, man. I appreciate that. Um, Discord for any requests. Links down below for all of these things that I just mentioned. Richard Huckle. I just found out about this dude yesterday while I was watching a documentary that dropped today, I think. Y'all will see that documentary drop today. Or y'all ha should have seen it already if you're watching. Britain's most, Britain's worst, y'all know who this is. Let me scoot the title up. I ain't even going to say the word. Britain's worst who was murdered in jail. Let's get to it, man. This is the first of by a twisted and depraved man that's currently known to yeah, British police. His crime so shocking that it would take a court an hour to read through his charges when he would eventually be brought to justice an after hour? nearly a decade of abuse on children as young as just six months old. A disclaimer before we move forward, this story has in-depth discussions about child abuse, so if this is something you don't wish to listen to, then feel free to move on to another video. You say that you're not really a pro at anything except being a paedophile. What do you mean by that? You say, by no means am I claiming to be a king or a top dog, but the experiences I've had and the regularity of them put me way up in what people aspire to be. Did you write that? No How frequently would you engage in sexual activity with children? No but this case travels all around the world and includes various different countries, all linked by one thing, extremely dangerous child sex offenders. We head over to the UK though to start this story off and on the 1st of April, 1986, Richard Huckle is born to parents Edwin and Christina. He's born alongside his brother into a middle-class church-going family, living in the leafy market town of Ashford, Kent. And as he was growing up, he seemed destined for success. As a child, he attended Folkestone Primary School and students remember him as being quiet but popular with a former primary school student going on to say that although he was more on the quiet side, he was still fairly normal showing interest in such things as action man. This would be a stark contrast though once he moved to secondary school. After being only one of a select few to attend Harvey Grammar School, his life would begin to unravel as he started to drift away from the few friends that he had. And it's been alleged that he even dabbled in some petty crime, once getting in trouble for selling counterfeit Pokemon cards. Due to his quote, loner status at secondary school, Counterfeit Pokemon cards is crazy. I remember them days. He would be an easy target for bullies. One source would go on to say he was an odd kid so he couldn't go a day without some sort of ribbing about anything really and he was called rat-like because of his appearance. Richard would go on to achieve five GCSEs but when moving up to higher education he struggled with his AS levels. On his 17th birthday he received a digital camera that would spark his interest in photography and this in a sense would be the catalyst that would destroy hundreds of children's lives. After becoming Christian in 2004 though, and with him taken to his new hobby, Richard would be asked to take pictures at baptisms and other church events, which only made his love for photography grow. It grew that much that after dropping his AS level courses, he decided to attend Kent College, where he studied a vocational course in ICT and a GCSE course in photography. After not knowing which direction to take his life in, in 2005, Richard would approach an organization called World Challenge, where they would help him set up a gap year in Malaysia. When he touches down soon after, he arrives at an animal conservation program located in the jungle, here with a bunch of other Brits. You can't blame World Challenge for this, but their credibility gotta be cool getting questioned nowadays. Like, oh, who's coming? World Challenge? Ah, nah, we don't know about them. Hell nah. Hell nah, nope. 
restaurants. They do jobs such as cleaning up after the animals. Richard didn't really like working with the animals though and he headed back to the World Challenge offices in Malaysia and said he'd rather work in childcare, offering support in orphanages and schools. One orphanage was selected but they were unable to take in new volunteers. In hindsight, a bullet was most definitely Fast. dodged. Eventually, he would go on to be placed in the school with fellow gap year student Sammy G, where they helped teach English to young students. During this time, both he and Sammy had shared a small apartment together. She describes Richard as being nervous, not talking with anyone or even interacting with the children. Although he was reserved, within weeks of joining the school, he was causing problems. He was discovered to have been writing a blog where he was posting rude comments about other gap year students and locals with also making remarks about the World Challenge organization. Y'all should have kicked them out right there. Precursors, get out. No, we don't, we don't tolerate that type of behavior. So in October of 2005, he was moved on to a new placement at the community of Praise Church as a Sunday school teacher. According to one local journalist, the church was the hunting ground for his abuse. After arriving at the church, in his personal diary, he would immediately begin to write disturbing comments about the pupils. I had some of the children sit down with me for a cuddle. We got out the mattresses and had a relaxed session. The pastor of the church would later come out to distance these claims by saying that he was never a Sunday school teacher and that he hadn't had access to the children by himself. We can assume that the pastor is just saving face though because according to the World Challenge organization, after a complaint had been made from a parent that Richard had been hitting children, he was dropped by the organization fully and only one week later, he was independently rehired by the church. And this was also back. What? So the, 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 the organization dropped them as they should have dropped them. And before they dropped them, these claims are out that he was cuddle sessions. Like, come on, bro. I, man, I stumble my hoe. Like, come on, bro. Anyway, cuddle sessions. And then y'all rehired him? After they let him go? By Richard's diary account. Over the course of his stay, Richard would go on to learn the Tamil language, which was spoken by the community of the church. This basic knowledge helped him blend into the community, and families would even go on to invite him into their homes. But little did they know, a monster was about to emerge. It gets a bit hazy as to when Richard would start to abuse children. Some people claim that it was when he went to his Cambodia trip in 2006, which we're gonna get into whilst- He was in Malaysia and Cambodia. This claim it started at the church itself. For context of this video, we'll go with the church theory. And at some point, it's believed that Richard had became fond of a three-year-old girl who attended the church. And over a period of quite literally years, she'd been raped and abused by him. This had all been captured on camera and was even shown to the small child as she was growing up. The girl had raised the alarm to her father about the abuse, but she'd been shrugged off and told to shut up. After building- Never in my life, my boy. Never in my life. I, you got to listen to kids, man. Kids have no reason to make up this stuff. <laughs> Relationships outside of the church, he discovered a poor village where he decided to volunteer teaching English from time to time and claimed that he was a freelance photographer. The village is primarily made up of Indian families with poor education, and he would take photos of the village saying that's exactly what he was there to do. The local villagers even housed him there and provided him with basic necessities. According to a charity worker who kept in touch with the local villagers, she went on to say that they claimed he behaved pretty normally and there was no suspicion when he was around the children. Little did they know though, was the fact that they had a monster amongst them because for the following nine years, nine years? Yes, nine years, Richard Hucker would rape and abuse 29 children from that exact village. When the abuse started at that specific village though, it came in the form of pictures being taken to which no one was none the wiser. Yeah, uh, this is making my stomach turn. I can't eat, <laughs> shouldn't have ate that sandwich. This is making me want to throw up. But when he had started to touch the children, which were all aged between four and seven, inappropriately, that's when the alarm was raised to parents. But once again, these claims were ignored. In 2006, Richard decided to take a two week trip to Cambodia. It's crazy, bro. I know my daughter like the back of my hand. Every move she's gonna make, every face she's gonna make, 
every emotion she's gonna feel, and if anything is off, I'm going off. I don't care. Like if she come from school and anything is off, I'm uh, hey, everybody's gonna hear it. <laughs> Everybody at the school, so everything better go smooth. I don't play that. Everything, everything better go smooth. And then on top of that, when people see me and my daughter, they be like, "Oh, that's her dad." Like, like you better think twice. <laughs> don't do nothing. Don't do nothing silly. Don't even try it. Mm. Hey, this is bothersome. <laughs> on a homestay. In other words, this means families who put travellers up for a small prize. Over this two-week stay, it's believed that Richard Huckle, after going on to meet the family, would go on to molest a two-year-old child and would video his disgusting actions. There is conflicting reports that he abused two sisters aged four and six on this same trip to Cambodia, but he did go back to that exact same home one year later in 2007, where the abuse could have definitely continued with other family members. After realizing that he could get away with abusing children, Richard decides to stay in Malaysia beyond his gap year, basing himself in the capital, although he does take frequent trips back to England. He would then secure himself a student visa in 2011, studying IT at the Kuala Lumpur University, and also enrolled himself at the British Council in Kuala Lumpur, where he took a two month SELTA course, a certificate of English language to teach adults. Man, it's hiding in plain sight. Taking, doing all these things to make him look like an outstanding member of the community. That's why I don't trust people, bro. After completing the two-month SOTA course, Richard would decide to advertise himself as an English teacher on various websites which gained him access to children working at various schools, orphanages, and even privately with families. Another tactic that Richard would use to get into families' homes is when he would take frequent trips to Port Dixon, an area located just outside of the capital city by the coast, which was a family hotspot. His strategy would go as follows. He takes pictures of children he meets at the beach. He offers them prints of the photos to gain their trust and then speaks to the parents, where after a conversation starts to bubble, he offers to teach free English lessons to the children. But of course, we know what his true intentions were. In his diary, he writes about his success by saying, quote, I'm back again at Port Dixon and staying around the house of my 12th family. I spent time with a baby trying to get her to sleep in a hammock. Over the nine year period, four trips had been made to India where he visited various different orphanages, each orphanage coming out to explain that Richard Huckle was never allowed to be alone around the children and some of them had even felt off about his character. Here he is in 2013 in the New Hope for Children Orphanage. In a series of emails he wrote to the pastor of that orphanage, he persuades him to allow him to visit after claiming he can speak basic Tamil and he would be more than happy to use his photography and editing skills to help make promotional material for the ministry. When Richard Huckle would eventually get caught by authorities, the orphanage took to their Facebook page, distancing themselves from his involvement at the orphanage and claiming once again he wasn't around the children without supervision. Before we move forward, I just wanted to quickly note that no police investigations were ever opened about his time in India, neither by UK authorities or Indian authorities. But his behavior does mirror that of Malaysia and people do believe that children had been abused whilst over in India. But in the many years of abuse and rape to multiple children between the ages of six months and 13 years old, just as you know, he had been recording his hideous acts on video and had been taking images, but he didn't keep them to himself. Since 2005 slash 2006, he'd been posting quite literally tens of thousands of abuse images to the dark web. Now, I don't need to break down what the dark web is because the majority of you watching- Yo, bro. Not only was he doing it, he was putting it out there for the rest of these type people to see and gawk over. What a, what a 90, what a, hey, everything he got, he deserved. A life sentence in, in, under, in bars, whatever happened to him in prison, he, hey. We'll know what it is. 
and as you know it is a hotbed for people like Richard Huckle. The content was shared to various websites but one which stored the most of his content was one by the name of The Love Zone. The Love Zone, when it was still available on the dark web, was one of the world's largest and most secure paedophile networks with around 45,000 members. Depraved paedophiles had been sharing images and video. 45,000? It's 45,000? Okay, like I know that there's a lot, but for, like quantifying the number 45,000? There's a lot of people in this world. I get it. 45,000 of them are, probably millions of them are, but like 45,000 on a website, that's of child sex abuse ranging in various categories. What made this website so secure from law enforcement though was the fact that any suspicious account would go on to be instantly deleted and users had to post material at least every 30 days or risk being exiled from the site. The more you posted the higher rank you was on the site with the producers area being accessed by only a few. In 2014 what users didn't realize though was that the site had been compromised by by police and Richard Huckle's near decade of child sex abuse was about to come to an end. But how exactly did law enforcement gain access to a website if any suspicious accounts would get deleted? Good morning, everybody. I'd like to talk about Project Spade this morning. In October... Somebody had to take a deep dive into the, that rink of people. 2010, undercover online officers with the Child Exploitation Section of the Toronto Police Service made contact with a male on the internet who was sharing very graphic images of young children being sexually abused. Through investigations, the officers were able to trace the internet connection to a male living in Toronto. I don't even understand how she could sit here and talk about this. Which, like, I get it, this, she's being professional, but like, that rage inside of me would have boiled out and you would have physically seen emotion coming from me. I, don't, I couldn't deliver this type of speech saying these type of words, man. That's why if you notice when I'm talking, I don't even be saying the words because like it just it's angering, it's enraging. The investigation revealed that this individual was running an exploitation movie, production and distribution company from an address within the city of Toronto. This company operated a website known as www.azoffilms.com where customers from around the world could place orders to have movies sent to them through the mail or through the internet. Investigators believe many of these movies were consistent with the Canadian Criminal Code definition of child pornography. At this time, the Toronto Police Service sought the assistance of the United States Postal... Okay, you can kind of see the anger on her face. Like, you can try to see... I can kind of see her trying to keep it cool inspection service as it appeared many of the movies were being exported into the United States. The Toronto Police Service and the United States Postal Inspection Service then began a joint investigation. On May 1st, 2011, after a seven month long investigation, officers executed numerous search warrants at various locations across the city of Toronto. One of these search warrants was executed at the site of the purported business located in the west end of Toronto. Officers spent four days inside this business, cataloging the thousands of movies, computers, and other media located during their search. At this time, over 45 terabytes of information was seized from the business. 45 terabytes? Y'all know how, one, how big one terabyte is? Four, 45 of them? And to give you some perspective, this is equivalent to a stack of paper as tall as 1,500 CN Towers. On the same date, a search warrant was also executed at the residence of the owner-operator. Hey Siri. Huh? CN Tower. <sighs> Fifteen hundred of them. Yo. Operator of the business, Mr. Brian Way. It is alleged that officers located hundreds of thousands of images and videos detailing horrific sexual acts against very young children, some of the worst that they have ever viewed. In 2011, a then 42-year-old Canadian Brian Way had been arrested after Project Spade was carried out by law enforcement agencies in Canada 
and the United States respectively. He would eventually go on to be charged with 15 offences in relation to 176 videos made by his production company Azoff Films. The 176 videos which had been produced revealed that 386 children from Spain, Romania, Ukraine and Australia had been used in these films, all prepubescent with some as young as just five years old. In court, his defense team would argue that he shouldn't be charged for every video because some depicted nudist films of young boys at play, to which the judge agreed but said 60 of the 176 videos fell under what Canadian law classes as child pornography. After pleading guilty to various offenses, head of the production company Brian Way would eventually go on to be sent sentenced to 10 years imprisonment but had his sentence reduced after alleging yo 10 years is not enough and then got it re and he himself was abused whilst in custody. Project Speed led to 348 people being arrested around the world over a two to three year period with the investigation only being brought to light in 2013, although it did start in 2010. After a man had been arrested in connection with Project Spade in Queensland, Australia, a quick search of his computer would show that he had been a member on the Love Zone, so police took control of that account. So now police finally had a breakthrough in regards to this infamous dark website they'd been trying to gain access to for quite literally years at this point, but they still had hurdles to jump because at this point they were just just one of 45,000 members. It was now time to track the main admin and strike this paedophile website at its heart. Now that Australian law enforcement had inside access to the website, it was time to go for the snake's head. With loose intel that the CEO had been located in Australia from images that he had been posting online and quickly noticing that he would regularly start messages with the unusual greeting of hires the search was on. Paul Griffiths, officer for Task Force Argos, responsible for the investigation of online child exploitation and abuse in Australia, would later come out to say that the task force had labored over the word hires, saying it was that specific that no one on his team used the phrase, neither anyone they knew. When it was punched into Google, of course, it returned thousands of hits, but in any related posts where the greeting was used, it had all been women. Although the search term would give around 450,000 results at the time Paul was interviewed, three mistakes had been made by the CEO, which ultimately would go on to see him be arrested by law enforcement officers. In Adelaide, a man was discovered using the greeting on a four-wheel drive discussion forum, and believe it or not, his username was a close copy of the CEO's handle on the love zone. Hires was also found on a separate basketball forum with that same username. And it was then it clicked that they must have found the man that they were looking for. The user on the four wheel drive forum had asked for advice on raising his car suspension with people suggesting parts for him to do so. A quick search on Facebook would show that someone was trying to source those exact parts for a VW utility, but the Facebook profile was bogus. Back on the forum board and detectives had started to get involved asking this user for more information surrounding the vehicle. It was then that this person had posted a picture of the vehicle but had forgot to blur the registration plate out. It was then police ran the plates which gave them a man. I ain't gonna lie, this is some of the great, this is great police work. Known as 32 year old. Shannon McCool. Now that police had their main suspect, new information about Shannon would come to light after a background check was run. No facial hair. Red flag number one. You see, Shannon had been employed by the state to look after children, and in fact, his childcare employment. <sighs> Bro, these people be having straight up jobs that involve that you like a trusted member of the public, like you like you. Dated back to 2004. So a 10 year time gap where he'd been working with children all around the world. Some red flags had been raised though, but nothing ever came from it. Like back in 2010, some staff questioned the way he behaved around the children, including raising the possibility that on occasions he had inappropriate physical contact with some of the children or later being convicted on two counts of aggravated indecent assault 
gross indecency and aggravated production of child pornography in relation to a two-year-old. He was still working with children after these alarms had been raised. Four days after Shannon had been identified, it was time for police to move in. Two officers from South Australia police quite literally walked up to his door, gave it a knock. He answered, he was arrested, and luckily for them, the computer was turned on and they now had full access to both his computer and the Love Zone paedophile website. He would eventually go on to be charged with 18 offences against seven young children he cared for between 2011 through to 2014. This was due to evidence mounting up against him and he had a distinctive freckle which was spotted on his finger and had been seen in those abuse videos. It would then be in 2015 he was sentenced to 35 years in prison, but in 2018, 35. That sentence would be reduced to 28 years, which means he could be out after serving 26 years after helping authorities prosecute more. These dudes should never get out. They're, they're, they're sick. And their sickness cannot be healed. In my opinion, they should never get out paedophiles. So, with now one of the world's largest online paedophile networks being suddenly run from the Brisbane headquarters of the Queensland police, it was time for the police to gather as much intel as they could to go on and arrest and charge more paedophiles. They had left the site running for around six months while paedophiles continued to post and talk about their twisted behaviour. Police had made a hit list of worst offenders they wanted to catch and on top of Get that them list all. was no all 45,000 of them. The than Richard Huckle. Richard had made the hit list because he was a producer, uploading exclusive fresh material on a weekly basis. Argos officer Paul Griffiths would say, quote, he belittled others on the forum for claiming they were paedophiles. He thought they were just sitting at home living off other people's experiences Why he was out there living the life. He continued, Huckle- Bro, what kind of sick sadist? What are you that Who talked about leaving a legacy where he'd be remembered because of the material he produced. He got to the point where he was actually titling his work, saying it was in his studio, he was definitely branding. But Paul explained that Richard's material wasn't sought after due to the fact that he wasn't particularly popular. The investigation would prove a difficult one to start with though, as Richard took precaution, blurring faces and backgrounds along with erasing metadata from his work, but early clues would start to pinpoint that it had been a man in Southeast Asia after a paedophile wrote to him, quote, pity you're far away, to which Richard responded, I'm probably closer than you think, and other intelligence also pointed to this person spending time in Malaysia. But it's not what he photographed that would be a breakthrough in the case, rather what he photographed with. Embedded in some of his images, overlooked when he swept the files of metadata, was the brand and model of his Olympus camera. Officers spent hours upon hours sweeping through photography sites such as Flickr and Trek Earth for photos taken in Southeast Asia using that very same camera, and sure enough, legal images of children were appearing Great, great police work. Great. They was doing their due diligence. From various parts of that region of the world. Police traced the legitimate photographs to an email address, which in turn illuminated his account on other websites. In echo of the Shannon McCall case, one of these accounts was registered under a similar name to that of a paedophile on the love zone. Paul Griffith said, quote, realistically by that stage, there was no chance it could have been anyone else. The trail also led to a studio named Hukul Photography Productions. It was based in Malaysia and linked to Richard Huckle's public Facebook profile. There, he had been more brazen than police could have imagined. On Facebook, there were photos of similar children and the same children that appeared in the abuse material that he published on the dark web. After discovering that Richard Huckle was a British national, it was time to yeah. pass the information on to the UK's FBI, the National Crime Agency, and they were alerted about his crimes but he would remain in Malaysia untouched for another four months after Malaysian police said- I ain't gonna lie, this is probably the last time I'm gonna do one of these, look at one of these type of dudes, man, because this just be, this will ruin my whole day. I mean, I'm probably gonna have to go watch The Simpsons or something after this. So I'm happy, like, cause this, this right here, 
I don't know how anybody could watch this and just have a have a good day afterwards. Like, and it's early. It's ten a.m. That they didn't have enough evidence to arrest him, but after posting on Facebook that he was returning to the UK in December of 2014, the monster that had raped and abused children for multiple years was about to be stopped in his tracks. On the 19th of December 2014, Richard Hooker would arrive at Gatwick Airport, and upon arrival, his father had been waiting for him. But instead of a warm welcome home for Christmas, he was greeted by National Crime Agency detectives who You're going to jail, buddy. arrested him on various charges. His computers and hard drives were seized, but to no surprise, certain parts of the computer and his other devices had been encrypted. You said you're not really a pro at anything except being a paedophile. What do you mean by that? No you say, by no means am I claiming to be a king or a top dog, but the experiences I've had and the regularity of them put me way up in what people aspire to be. Did you write that? No a king or a top dog? Would you engage in sexual activity with children? Okay. After refusing to give police passwords to gain access to his devices, Richard gives a no comment police interview and then he's bailed due to him not having any previous convictions. His bail conditions were that he lives at his parents' address whilst investigations were ongoing. Upon release from custody though, he's questioned by his mother about the allegations and Huckle admits to raping children between the ages of 3 and 13, at which point his parents refused to allow him to remain in the house as they shouldn't w parents and quite literally from reports they had begged police to take him back to custody after leaving the home he was rearrested and charged with 91 counts including creation and possession of child pornography rape of a child under the age of 12 digital penetration child abuse and facilitating the commission of child sexual offenses by creating all right okay a pedophile uh, menu he was a menu mission of child sexual offenses by creating a pedophile manual. He was denied bail by police and remanded to court where application for bail was also denied and so he was remanded to HMP Belmarsh due to the severity of the charges. At an initial hearing at the Old Bailey in January of 2016, Richard pleaded not guilty to all 91 charges which took over an hour to be read to the court. At this point, the prosecution started to prepare three, yes, three separate trials as they didn't believe a single jury should be subjected to all of the graphic evidence that would be presented. Yeah, They'd also prepared counsellors for each juror as they thought being shown all this graphic material of children being raped and abused would cause psychological problems for them after the trial had ended. But after this hearing, police had managed to crack some of his devices which showed 20,253 indecent images of children with around 1,000 of them showing Huckle abusing them. Police would never crack the incredible fully and they say the 20,000 videos and pictures were quite literally a tiny percentage of what was stored on his devices. It would then be in April of that same year he went on to plead guilty to 71 of the 91 charges that were brought against him. As a result of his confession, prosecutors decided not to pursue the remaining 20 charges but they did ask that they lie. And they should have pursued every, every angle, every charge on his file. So the charges had been against 23 girls and boys aged between 6 months and 12 years old, 22 of the victims believed to be Malaysian, whilst one is believed to be Cambodian. The 71 6 months bro, come on. Exact charge this would be 31 counts of sexual assault of a child under the age of 13, 12 counts of taking indecent photos of children, 6 counts of assault by penetration, 13 counts of rape of a child under 13, 3 counts of causing a child under 13 to engage in sexual activity, 3 counts of causing a child under 13 to engage in penetrative sexual activity, arranging or facilitating the commission of child sex offenses by writing a child sex abuse manual, making over 20,000 indecent manual. images, and advertising child pornography. He wrote a manual, they say. Over the three-day sentencing hearing, more details would start to emerge surrounding this case, with the prosecutors going on to say that although this case surrounds 23 victims, it's believed that number could way easily more. be as high as 200. In way court, more. the prosecution would go on to say that Richard Huckle, 
would make his way into poor communities in Malaysia where he would go on to abuse and rape girls, boys, babies, toddlers and preteens. It was explained that Huckle's youngest victim was a baby just six months old whilst another baby was attacked just after her first birthday. A further seven were aged between one and three when they were attacked by him whilst some were abused for years. One child had suffered abuse between 2007 to 2014, whilst another had suffered from 2006 to- I hope all the victims that he's messed with or done this to are getting the proper, the proper whatever's needed for them to live the most normal life that they possibly can, because this dude right here, man. 2013. Huckle's activity had been posted to the Love Zone website, which we've already been over, and in court, the prosecution would read out extracts about his sickening posts where he would boast about the abuse. One extract reads, impoverished kids are definitely much, much easier to seduce than middle-class Western kids. I plan on publishing a guide on this subject sometime. He would also say that he would love to make a small income of selling child porn. But some of the most shocking revelations came from extracts that were given about a three-year-old girl and a five-year-old girl. In reference to the three-year-old girl, he said, quote, I'd hit the jackpot. A three-year-old girl as loyal to me as my dog, and nobody seemed to care. The three-year-old I can have so much sex with that it's just boring. Tongue out emoji. Well, at least she's now ready for business with pedo funding. Yeah, I know. Very Yo, what the fuck is happening? You got, are you serious? Very twisted and sick. Pedo funding was explained as a crowdfunding website on the dark web where people would pay to view child rape videos. One grooming tactic Richard would use on children is that he would take them to richer parts of the city, of course. The children that he abused were from poor neighborhoods. On these trips out, he would take innocent photos with the children and post them on Facebook. But on the dark web, it was a completely different ball game. Huckle had also wrote a 60 page child sex abuse manual explaining how to get away with exploiting children in Asia titled Pedophiles in Poverty child lover guide but if that hasn't made you sick to your stomach already then from november of 2013 to november of 2014 so one month before he was arrested he started to implement a system into his abuse called guido points chart now how this would work is he would award himself points based on 15 categories Rape keep would have score? scored 15 and that would have been the worst category well within one year of implementing the system he amassed a score of 1,305. So this just goes to show you how much rape and abuse went on in that year alone. And remember, this went on for nearly 10 years. But it does seem as if Richard Hooker was extremely delusional after he said that very few people cared about the children and he didn't want to do anything that would lead them to long-term damage physically. But if that about? was the case, for one, you know as a grown adult what sexually abusing and raping a child would do. But on top of this, you literally rape some of the children over multiple years. It was then the judge handed him 22 life sentences with a minimum term of 25 years, which pretty much meant he would end up dying in prison. But this isn't exactly where the story ends, and for some, this is what you'd call twenty-two life sentence. poetic justice. On the 13th of October 2019, Paul Fitzgerald, a convicted... This dude was wild too, though. A sex offender himself, who had sexually assaulted a young child, on a list of many other sexually related charges, would subject Richard Huckle to an hour and 19 minutes of torture before killing him with later intentions of eating him at HMP Full Sutton. After selecting Richard as his victim one week prior, he would put him through what's been described as a prolonged attack designed to humiliate and degrade. His hands and feet had been bound before he was gagged and strangled with an electric cord. He was then raped and a spoon was inserted into his anus which entered his lower bowel. He had his jaw broken from having his head smashed on the cell floor around six or seven times before getting finished off when a pen fixed with a blade to its end was inserted up his nose and into his brain. When staff eventually realized what was happening he was removed from the cell and was quoted as saying that he enjoyed it. Staff knew what was going on. An hour and a half? Come on now. Staff knew what was up. They let that ride out. It 
and would have gone on to kill other inmates if he hadn't been stopped because he was having too much fun. It's also thought that if he'd been left in the cell a little while longer that he would have cooked him and started to eat him. He was eventually put on trial where in a nutshell he explained that he wanted payback for what Richard did to his innocent victims and despite the brutal murder he shouldn't be seen as a victim adding he wanted Richard to know what it felt like. The judge then handed him a life sentence with a minimum term of 34 years and whilst sentencing him the judge called him a psychopath who derived pleasure from imagining torturing, raping, killing and eating others and as the judge was saying this to him Paul looked up at him and started to laugh. But if there's one thing we can take away from this story it's that Richard Huckle was an evil, sick, twisted, depraved individual and you can see why the British media labelled him one of the worst paedophiles to ever come from the UK. Can you just imagine how many children's lives that this monster has affected moving forward because it's a well known fact that physically and mentally when someone gets abused especially from a young age that stays with them throughout their lives. I know charity have since been involved with certain victims that have been identified and are thankfully offering support to those that need it. There's also classes now about this kind of crime in Malaysia because it was a very taboo subject that believe it or not a lot of the population thought was just a western problem but although Richard is from the UK you can bet there's hundreds if not thousands of people just like him in the country. Let me give you a stop, stop, everybody stop. TLO, I'm gone, y'all. I'm going to go, I don't know what I'm going to do for the rest of the day. I'm going to go to the gym, maybe.